Flywheels make use of kinetic energy associated with rotation about an axis. Here is a flywheel attached to a steam engine. It's used to provide motive force when the engine is between power strokes, so that is to smooth the output of the engine. Here is a modern carbon fibre flywheel used in racing cars and buses to store up several hundred kilojoules of energy and release it on demand. The road wheels on cars are not flywheels but are still rotating bodies with the same behaviour. The energy used to spin them up when a car moves is lost energy and there's a big push to get wheel weights down and reduce this lost energy. So, a rotating body can smooth energy delivery, store energy or waste energy. We'd better understand them. Here's my version of a car wheel. When it rotates, each part moves at a velocity proportional to its distance from the axis. Obviously the direction of the velocity varies with position and this course will teach you how to find it. Today we only need speeds. Let's analyse the wheel by breaking it up into lots of small elements, the usual thing. Each element will have some mass, mi, and some distance from the axis, ri. The kinetic energy of this element is half mi vi squared, and vi is omega times ri, where omega is the rotational velocity. So we can say that ti is half mi ri squared omega squared. Kinetic energy is a scalar and we can add up the kinetic energy of all the little bits to get the kinetic energy of the wheel as half sum of mi ri squared times omega squared. I've taken the constants out of the sum. The half is just a number and the omega squared is related to the rotational speed but the summed quantity is a property of the wheel known as the mass moment of inertia in Miriam and Craigie, the standard text, but today we'll mainly use its universal symbol I. So the rotational kinetic energy is a half I omega squared, which has a direct analogy to half mv squared for linear motion. And indeed, all the linear equations of motion have rotational analogies using I and omega. You'll do a formal derivation of I during the course, but for today we just need the kinetic energy is a half I omega squared with I a property of the rotating body equal to the sum of mi ri squared. Here's our flywheel. We're going to hang a known weight on a string wrapped around its shaft and measure how long it takes for the weight to drop a known distance from a standing start. Let's watch some specimen tests. You don't want to watch them all, but we did 19 tests with weights from 2 to 20 newtons and they all fell one meter. The biggest weights fall the fastest and all of the weights fall a lot more slowly than they would if they weren't attached to the flywheel.
initially all the energy in the system is going to be gravitational potential energy, MGH. As the test progresses, this will be converted to kinetic energy of the wheel and the weight, and some energy will be lost. Let's show that we can ignore the kinetic energy of the falling weight. Start with the energy balance, that is, the original gravitational potential energy is converted to kinetic energy of the weight, plus kinetic energy of the flywheel, and some losses. One of the standard equations of motions for a body under constant acceleration is distance is equal to the average speed times the total time. Rearrange this to get the final velocity in terms of the height and the drop time. The kinetic energy of the weight is half mass times velocity squared. I've used mg over g because our base weights were in newtons, not kilograms. The gravitational potential energy is mgh. Let's find the ratio of the two. It's basic arithmetic, and we get at the end 2h over gt squared. 2h is 2, g is 10, and t squared is several hundred. We can conclude that the final kinetic energy is a fraction of the initial kinetic energy of the initial potential energy, sorry, and ignore it. To analyse our tests, let's plot the final flywheel energy against the original gravitational potential energy. So that's half I omega squared against MGH for a large number of tests. In an ideal world, there would be a one-to-one -one relationship and the plot would have a slope of one. In the real world, there's some energy lost to friction and the like. Let's assume it's the same for all the tests and we can simply move the plot to the right to indicate the extra input energy we need for the same output energy. The slope's still 1, but now the x-intercept is finite. We can't calculate half i omega squared because we don't know i, but we can get omega from the final drop speed, and we can get the final drop speed from the drop time and the drop height. So let's plot half omega squared against mgh. This is obviously half i omega squared divided by i, so its slope is going to be 1 over i. Easy. Here's your data, and apart from one dodgy looking point near the top, it's not bad. Your job is to calculate the slope and the x-intercept.